did you say to go on? Oh, I got no. I don't have no. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're on the West Coast, another time zone. Um, we're about to start the presentation momentarily. We're allowing more people to join. Bernard, can you put the main, the slides up so on the, on the first page? Your volume, go to your volume right there. There, turn it up. We can ask everyone to put their phones on mute or their, and their, their computer auto on mute. Hello, can you all hear me? We can hear you, Grandma. Okay. We're not ready yet. Okay. Bernard, can you put it in presentation form? Keep going over to the right. There's another. Keep going a little bit further, a little bit further. Okay, good afternoon. Everyone, uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, we want to go ahead and start uh, this webinar. This is um, the second part of if you were attended the training orientation that occurred on Monday, October the 24th. Uh, this is going to be a second part. This one will be more in great detail on the grant management training webinar part. It's, it's really catered to the grantees that whether you are competitive SRAE or general department SRAE, or you are maybe a tribal or pre or, or competitive uh, prep as well. Uh, this training, uh, we wanna just welcome everyone to this. This will be a good opportunity. We get an in-depth training on your grant management piece of, of the, um, your grant. We can proceed to the next slide. Just want to kind of just give, remind individuals once again, this is the structure of the Family and Youth Service Bureau, the FISB Bureau, and this is where we fall on the org chart. We fall in a division of optimal adolescent development um, for your grant. Next slide, please. For this, uh, for this presentation, we have two speakers that they're from our grant management office that will be doing the presentation for these for this webinar. And I'm going to pass it on to them for the presentation. First, we'll start with Germa and then Bernard will follow up after that. And then we'll have some question and answer period at the end. Germa, you're ready. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gurma Raya. I'm a grant management specialist. This discussion is a brief, a brief discussion on the roles of uh, grants management office in relation to new applicants. Uh, there are three important aspects of the grants management office. The role it plays are it's responsible for fiscal management and administration of grant award. Fiscal management and administration of grant award. Second is ensuring compliance with applicable laws, regulations, policies, and procedures and technical aspects of grants and fiscal monitoring. Providing guidance on fiscal requirements related to grant awards, terms and conditions, 
post-award changes, reporting, and close-out procedures. Next page, please. And then this awarding agency would still avail its assistance to grantees for post-award activities. That's after uh, the grants have been awarded, the funds have been made available. There may be certain aspects, certain points that uh, grantees uh, require help on. Uh, those are requesting amendments, requesting amendments to the original grant application, such as changing key personnel, budget modification, and no cost extension. Clarification of budget issues, particularly allowable costs. Guidance on submitting fiscal reports and other official correspondence. New grants may not be uh, quite familiar with these aspects of the grant and will definitely mostly come to us for assistance and will always be available for, to give this assistance. Next page, please. HS Grants Policy Statement provides general terms and conditions for all HHS discretionary grants and cooperative agreements. This is uh, found in 45 CFR Part 75, Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for HHS Awards. Codified from Office of Management and Budget, Circular 2 CFR Part 200. At the link, at the below link, it's, it's, you can find this. Next page, please. PMS, PMS, the PMS is a payment and accounting system. It's a, a different entity. It's uh, not, uh, they're cooperative entities, but it's not the same as ACF. It's a different entity. PMS provides the payment and accounting system for all HHS grants. Payment and accounting system for all HHS grants. Payment, your payment, you make a request whenever you make need a payment, you make a request via PMS. And then grantees are responsible for requesting payments and reporting expenditures to the payment management system. Payments are always made at your request. And grantees, grantee has to spend funds within 72 hours after requesting drawdown. You request drawdown and you have 72 hours to disperse this money. You're not supposed to keep it more than 72 hours which is three days. Next page, please. Payment management site. We visit PMS website. You're given the uh, website there, pms.psc.gov to find your PMS account, accountant, contact, info for PMS access assistance or any drawdown questions. If you have, any questions regarding access, you don't call us, you call the PMS directly and you have your access in the PMS website itself. Next page, please. Submission of federal financial status report and program progress report. There are reports that you're supposed to submit periodically to PMS and then directly to us. Performance progress reports are due semi-annually. Submit reports via grant solutions. Due 30 days after the end of reporting period. The end of the period for the first uh, half year would be uh, March 31st, which is six months. Then you have one month to do the report for that half year. Then the second half year would end on September 29th. And then you have one month to do that report. 
the second report. Final progr pro progress reports due September 29 to 2024. Performance progress. These are performance progress reports. Financial reports, the same period. They, they go with, for with the same period, within the same period, uh, half yearly. Annual and final SF-425 is due 90 days after the end of the reporting period. This is a final report or project period. The due dates, they're given at the bottom. This is half yearly, April 30, 2023, covers the period of 9-30-2022 to March 31st, 23. The second report due on 10-30-23 covers the period of April 1, 2023 to September 29, 2023. Annual report due 12 29 23 that's 90 days after the end of the period. Next page, please. This is a federal financial report. It's a long piece of uh, paper. Uh, you have all information at the top, the grant number, the award number, the period it covers and everything is given at the top. We're, we're concerned about the reports on 10, number 10, D to H. These are total federal funds authorized, which is uh, consistent throughout the year. You give that the entire amount of the grant would go in this line, and it stays there. The next one, the next one is federal share of expenditures. That's the amount of uh, disbursements you make within a given period, half yearly, yearly, and so on. And then federal share of unliquidated obligations. If there are unliquidated, usually. You liquidate payments right when you get your, your payments, you request payments and make payments. But in case if there are unliquidated uh, obligations, they go in this line. Then total federal share of expenditures would go in this. The periodically, whatever goes, periodically go in this line. The total in line G. Then the difference at the, at the between line D and line G is the amount that's still in your hand, that's an obligated amount. Then at the bottom, there are uh, approvals. Who prepared it, who signed it, the date prepared, and the period specifically would go at the bottom. Then next, next page, please. SA 428. SA 428 report is a tangible property report. Example is tangible property equipment and supplies purchases $5,000 or more per item. Has three parts, an annual report, a final award closeout, and a disposition request. That's all 428 form is about. And that's for items. Items that are five thousand dollars or more, anything less than that, you don't have to report. It doesn't; it's not recognized as an asset here. Report is due no later than ninety days after the end of the project period. Submit the form to the to the grant notes in grant solutions. There is a grant notes section in the grant solutions. That's where you submit it. This is uh, the end of my part, and uh, I thank you very much. Bernard would take from here. Thank you, Gurma. I appreciate that. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time today to join this short training and getting some more information regarding the stewardship of, of your award. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the main uh, tool that you'll be utilizing uh, throughout the period of performance of your grant award, that is grant solutions. 
So the effective use of grant solution is based on the user roles. The two main user roles are the AR or the authorized representative and the PD that is the project director. We usually call it the PIPD. So if you see that in communication, it is the same thing. Um, the roles and grant solutions have access to make any requests or upload documents. Now there are other roles that you can um, request and that would go directly to the grant solutions help desk. Uh, those other roles can be found on the Grant Solutions website, and they are all supporting roles with read-only access. Now, OGM, which is your or your grants management specialist, which is us, is responsible for ensuring that the correct authorized representative and the correct project director for grants have access to Grant Solutions. So, any questions regarding those two positions, those two roles, you can direct your, those questions to your assigned grants management specialist. That grants management specialist can be found on the notice of award you receive for your grant award. Um, the grantee control over submission of post award amendments is found with these two roles, that is the authorized representative and the PIPD. Um, you can contact us uh, your, your, or your grants management specialist at any time regarding these questions regarding grant solutions or these roles. Um, there is also the grant solutions help desk so if it's grant solution specific, you contact them. But if it's regarding your the fiscal responsibility of your award, you contact us. Uh, post award amendments requiring prior prior approval. So as you can see, there's a change in scope or objective, uh, carryovers, uh, change and or absence in key personnel, PIPD or AR, no cost extensions or significant rebudgeting. And I'm gonna go into detail more with each of these uh, particular post-award requirements. Uh, let me just point this out to you. Grant Solutions does have training videos um, that provides instruction on post-award amendments. And you can find that on the Grant Solutions website at the link provided here. Um, and just to go back to uh, something that uh, Grandma already spoke about, PMS also has training videos as well. They have a, uh, a manual that would also assist you guys in going through the functionality of that system as well. So the AR and PIPD changes. So a recipient is required to notify ACF of any changes in the status of the principal investigator, project director, or authorized representative and request a change under the following conditions. That means replacing the PIPD or AR, or if they are absent for a continuous period of months, of three months or more, you would need to request by submitting in the grant solution system an amendment for the change of PIPD or the change of grantee authorizing official. Uh, though you can find those amendments in, uh, in the grant solution system or the reduction of time devoted to project by 25% or more from the level in the approved application. So once again, if you're changing those individuals or you're changing their time, you have to have prior approval before moving forward with that change. The required forms for that change are a cover letter signed by the current or new authorized representative, which would include the name and title of the previous or new PIPD or AR, and include a brief statement behind the reasoning for the change and background information of the new personnel. It's slightly different with the PIPD and the AR because with the AR, it does not require the resume of the PI. Let me, let me start over. <laughs> if you're submitting a change of PIPD, we're gonna request the uh, resume of that individual. If you're just changing the authorized representative, you don't have to submit the uh, resume of that individual. Just a slight nuanced difference in that in that application. And you will have to submit the SF-424 with their names identified on that form. Budget modifications. I don't like to use the term significant rebudgeting because it always is dependent on what is being changed. So whenever you decide that you're gonna propose a budget modification or budget revision, always consult with your program officer first and also 
talk to your assigned grants management specialist. These are things that you want to discuss first before submitting or trying to move forward with it. So prior approval for budget modifications required when the federal share of the awarded budget is below 250,000 and the cumulative transfer, sorry, got things inside my screen, between direct cost categories is above 25% of the total award budget or the federal share of the awarded budget is above 250,000 and the cumulative transfer between direct cost categories is above 10% of the total award budget. Budget modifications required documents are the cover letter signed by the authorized representative. So if you are writing to inform ACF of the budget revision that does not require prior, prior approval, clearly indicate that budget revisions do not meet the threshold to be considered significant rebudgeting. And you should submit a cover letter signed by the authorized representative to grant solutions and grant notes detailing your intent to modify your budget for documentation purposes. Modifications to, per, to the personal line items should be discussed with your project officer prior to submission. If you are writing to request a budget re revision that is considered significant, clearly indicate the proposed activities. Requests must be initiated prior to the end of the budget period for which you are requesting a revision. So this is just reinforcing what I just said. Regardless if it's, it meets the threshold of significant or not, Please always discuss it first with your program officer and your assigned grants management specialist and submit in writing what you're proposing. Those forms would be the SF-424, the SF-424A, and the budget, and budget narrative and justification. Next item is a carryover. Carryover is a request uh, funds to be used to complete unfinished activities from the prior year and the cost must have been reflected in the prior year budget. Carryover budget should be requested as soon as possible after the submission of the annual FSR. So that means you're waiting three months after the end of the prior budget period before you submit the carryover request. That means after you have submitted the annual FSR, after the 90 day liquidation period, by waiting that three month period, that 90 day period, you're ensuring that you're submitting an accurate account of your unobligated balances that you would like to have carried over from the prior year. So the required documents for the carryover are again, the cover letter signed by the authorized representative. You're providing the amount of the request, including unexpected unexpended federal funds, as well as any non-federal matching funds, if applicable, I don't believe you guys have matching funds, that were not committed during the budget year. Only include the amount you are requesting. Do not include other budget year amounts. Do not include any other amount beyond the carryover request amount. Clearly indicate that the funds will be used to complete activities which were approved, but not completed by midnight on the last day of the budget period as allocated in the final budget of record. You also have to submit the SF-424, the SF-424A, and it must be accompanied by a budget narrative and justification. The no-cost extension. Your no-cost extensions are requested to complete activities of the grant in the final year of the project period. Requests are not approved merely for the purpose of using unobligated balances. Requests should be made 45 days prior to the end of the project period and are one-time extensions up to 12 months. And now it's very important that you, re you recognize it's 45 days prior to the end of the project period. That way that gives your federal project officer and your grants management specialist enough time to review it and issue a notice of award if approved. Can't wait till the last day, can't wait till the end of the project period is over. Got to do it at least 45 days prior, but that's not something you have to worry about now because that's not till the last budget period or the end of the project period. The no cost extension does not authorize additional spending or any new activities beyond the purpose consistent with the original award. Now understand the no cost extension does not award you additional funds. It just awards you additional time to complete the approved activities and goals and objectives of the award.
you can uh, the instructions to our founding grant solutions when requesting a no cost extension. The request includes the cover letter, revised expiration date should be in that in that letter, supporting reasons for your request, and the remaining balance. Now to submit or to get, make sure you have a good chance of being approved for your no cost extension. All of your SF four two fives and PPRs from the previous and current budget periods must be on file. So that means you've completed the SF four two fives and PMS, and all the PPRs have been uploaded to Grant Solutions. Change of scope. Uh, change of scope occurs when the recipient proposes to change the objectives, aims, or purposes identified in the approved application. This can include shifting emphasis from one area to another, changing the service area, changing the approved design of the program, or making budget changes that cause a project to change substantially from what, from that which was approved. So any change in your program objectives or goals will require a change of scope. Now, this is one of those things, again, that you would discuss first with your federal project officer before submitting. Required documents, again, cover letter signed by the authorized representative, clearly indicating the new proposed activities and how it deviates from the originally purpose plan, provide a justification as to why this change of scope is necessary and how it will directly impact the overall success of your project. The SF424, SF424A, SF425 must be current, and the, of course, the budget and budget narrative and justification. The project narrative would also need to be updated, meaning your project description. Uh, it must clearly state the principal and supporting objectives of the project. Applicants must address how the objectives stated relate to the overall purpose of the program and describe how objectives will be achieved. Your new expected outcomes. Identify the outcomes to be achieved from the project. Outcomes should relate to the overall program. If research is part of the pros proposed work, outcomes must include hypothesized results and implications of proposed research. And of course, whatever your new approach may be, outline a plan of action as describes the scope and detail of how the proposed project will be accomplished. Once again, please reach out to your ACF project officer if you have questions surrounding the project narrative. This is just reinforcing again what we said, discuss this with your project officer first before submitting. Last is closeout, your grant closeout. It's not to the last year of your project. And we will send you a reminder at least six, uh, six months prior to the end of the project period, project period, letting you know what is required and what is needed. Um, so you can find grant closeout procedures though uh, in 45 CFR part 75.3.81 or 2 CFR 200.343. Both of these are, can be found online and are easily accessible to you. Uh, the federal awards agency will close out the federal award when it determines that all applicable administrative actions and all required work for the federal award have been completed by use the grantees. This section specifies the actions the non-federal entity and the federal award agency must take to complete this process at the end of the period of performance. You will submit no later than 90 days after the end of the project period of performance all performance, financial, and programmatic reports as required by the terms and conditions of the federal award. The federal award agency may approve an extension when requested by the non-federal entity. A non-federal entity must liquidate all obligations incurred under the federal award no later than 90 calendar days after the end of the period of performance as specified in the terms and conditions of the federal award. The disposition of property equipment must be treated according to Title 45 Code of Federal Regulations Part 75.381. Now we're opening up to any questions that you may have. I'll let Corey uh, moderate that. Well, thank, thank you, Bernard, and thank you, Agurmo. Um We want to open this time up for questions that you may have for Bernard or Gurma on any grant-related 
uh, procedures or processes that you may have questions on at this time. Once again, my name is uh, Captain Corey Palmer. I'm just moderating this session and hoping that um, we are able to answer all your questions here today. I also want to announce that you know I have attached the slides on in the chat so you can download that as well. So go ahead, we're opening it up for questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I know it's echoing. So my question is, is there a way you can send us a, um, like for this FR425, can you send us like a, um, example how to fill that out Bernard and Gurma uh sorry. um the let me let me uh, put it like this it's, it's it won't be a lot to fill out um the majority of the form itself is auto populated because you're completing it within the PMS system so the only thing that you're really updating is your expenditures. Everything else will be automatically calculated and automatically populated based on the drawdowns that you perform. And like I said, though, uh, there are training videos on the PMS website that can assist you with that. Okay, so um, our central finance office does this, but it would be good for us to know how to do that too. Good afternoon, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, on the PMS um, for filing the SF-425, um, it, it seemed like today when we we're on that system that we were not given the option of filing the one that's due October 30th. The only option we had was due one that was due December 28th. So we filled it out and submitted it and it said it was accepted. And then we went over to the grant solution system and it had transferred the numbers to the grant solution system. So it looked like it worked, but I didn't understand why, you know, there's one due April 30th, one due October 30th, and then there's seems to be one due in December. There shouldn't be any due until April 30th of next year. Your grant awards just started, so there's nothing to report. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is for a grant we're working on this year. So um, So you're talking about a separate award from the, the one that you were just awarded? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's the one that um, we're starting year two of a two-year grant. Okay. I'm, well, I, can, I, I, I don't have a problem discussing that while we're on here, but... Uh, for if you're missing the one that was that's due at the end of this month for the your current award that that you're in year two of, then uh, send your grants management specialist the uh, grant award number, and they can look into seeing why the FFR for the, the second semi second Samuel second semi annual wow you can tell it's after lunch second semi annual <laughs> FFR is not available for you to be completed so you because you should have completed the one for the end of october before submitting the one that's due at the end of december okay there only seem to be one option so um, right that's that's what i'm saying yeah. email your grant award number to your assigned grants management specialist so that they can look into why the ffr is not available for you to complete okay we'll do you thank you so have, much you should have done the december one first we should you said we should not have done the December one first that's correct yeah we have to complete the second semi-annual one first before doing the annual okay well we tried but it was it, when we did it it came up for the December one only okay I'll I'll check with the with our grant management specialist okay I'm Thank going you. to um ask some questions that we have from in the chat uh we have one individual to put in the chat that They've submitted uh, FFR on the PMS, but also on Grant Solution. Should they do it on both sites? 
No, you are only required to complete the federal financial report in payment management system. And the, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, there was a question before about instructions by the SF425. We have put it in the chat, a link. So it gives you some instructions on how to complete that form. And those instructions should also be included in the terms and conditions that were attached to your notice of award. There's a there's another question also says when drawing down funds from the PMS, are there any required documents that need to be uploaded? No, there are no required documents that need to be uploaded when making your drawdown. The only required documents are the semi-annual SF-425, but there's nothing that you need to submit every time you request a drawdown. Okay, thank you. And I think Katie, Katie has a question. I, I don't have a question. I just have a quick update. Um, I've gotten several emails from grantees regarding, uh, from existing grantees regarding the same question um, that was being asked about. Um, only having the December report available. That's a, a, apparently an issue in the system. Um, I was just emailing with um, David Lee about this. And so the payment management um, folks have been made aware and so that we're awaiting more information on that. So just if others have seen the same thing, know that it, it is an issue that has been raised and uh, the payment management system team is aware and working on it. Thank you, Caden. Um, it's another question that says, I have a report due in three days and it is labeled final PPR, but I think the report should be a semi-annual due 30 days after the end of the project period. I don't see the 90-day report in the system. Well, I would defer to your program specialist for that, but the form is the same. You're just marking it final instead of semi-annual. That select that option should be on the cover page of the PPR. Okay, thank you, Brian. Are there any other questions? Um, this is Labrita. If I can interject, Corey, if you don't mind, to that last question. Yes. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the question related to the final PPR, the final PPR, the one that's due 90 days after the end of your project period, we unfortunately in the performance progress reporting system within grant solutions, we do not have a specific um, section that you can upload or complete your PPR for submission there. Um, so we ask that if it's your 90 day end of your project period report that you submit it as a grant note, but you should be able to submit in grant solutions under the performance progress reporting portal, um, your semi-annual um, reports, but just not that um, final. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Labrita. Are there any other questions for the presenters? This is the opportunity to answer all of your questions that you may have, even if you're just thinking that it's a silly question, dumb question, no silly, dumb question. I will take this opportunity while you have them on hand to really get all of your questions answered. Even if you just- uh, I have a question. Something. This is Jeannie Hayes. Are you able to demonstrate how to access the grant note just as a, uh, I haven't done it for a while and I think it's kind of difficult. On the screen, are you able to do that? Demonstrate, the, you said a grant note? Yeah, how to access, can you give us, can you tell us how to access the grant note? That's how. Uh, our view is not the same as yours. Okay. So it, it All right. I'll just reach out to my program specialist if I need help. Thank you. Well, actually, your grants management special. Uh, I'm not sorry. <laughs> the grants management help desk. Sorry, grant solutions help desk would be able to assist you with that. 
But there's okay. also training videos within their system that would show you how to do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? All right, um, if there is no more questions, um, we have recorded this session. And so we will um, I will have the, we will send it out to those, we will send it out to all the grantees so they have it, um, especially for the ones that have, wasn't able to attend this session. Um, they will have opportunity to uh, view the session at a later date. And if you have any questions later on, I would, encourage you to reach out either to your grants management specialist that's, that's located on your notice of award or your program specialist regarding uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, and so at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, close this out and I will stop the uh, recording and thank everyone for their time. And also wanna thank the presenters uh, for their um, time and sharing the information. Thank you.